Right. Anyone who reads uh, Christian texts is bound to come up against uh, a particular word time and again. Repentance. The preaching of St. John the Baptist uh, and of our Lord Jesus Christ himself began with repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance, medania in Greek, literally means a change of mind, a change of heart. And so repentance begins with acknowledging that we are in the wrong, that we have made a mistake. Uh, it means changing our ways. In the Old Testament, God says to his people, my ways are not your ways, nor are my thoughts your thoughts. So repentance is basically this continuous attempt to, to change our ways to be more like God's ways, to change our thoughts to be more like his thoughts, to desire what he desires, and to do what he asks of us. Therefore, repentance goes hand in hand with humility. Uh, a proud person rarely accepts that he is in the wrong or that he's made a mistake. But having acknowledged our, our errors, we must then do something about it. So the first thing we do when we repent is that we acknowledge that we need repentance, uh, that we basically say sorry um, to the one we have wronged, being God. And the second thing is to put right the mistakes we are making. And then third, of course, is to strive to stay on the right path and not to fall into the same errors again. As an aid to repentance, the Orthodox Church provides the sacrament of confession. And it is also, perhaps more correctly known, as the sacrament of repentance and reconciliation. And I think this better sums up the nature of confession and reveals something of its original purpose. The sacrament of confession was originally, and still is, uh, the sacrament by which those who have been excommunicated, not necessarily formally, but those who have committed sins, which were very grievous and which prohibited them from receiving Holy Communion in the Church, uh, it's the sacrament by which those who were separated from Communion, who were excommunicated, were reconciled to the Church and brought back into Communion with the Body of Christ. That's why it's the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Um, the second century Christian work, The Shepherd of Hermas, one of those texts which didn't get into the New Testament canon, but which is part of our tradition, it's, it's greatly loved by the Orthodox. Um, this text informs us that originally only one confession was allowed in a person's life. We read, whoever is tempted by the devil and sins after that great and reverent calling, baptism, has one repentance, confession. But if he should sin and repent repeatedly, it is of no benefit to him. This is why for a long time, Christians delayed baptism until towards the end of their life. They were concerned that if they got baptized early and then they kept committing sins, that they would, their souls would be in serious uh, danger. Um, but as Christians became a little less strict and rigid in their spiritual and moral life, the church felt the need to become a little more relaxed and to move with the, not move with the times, that's the wrong way to put it, but to uh, respond to the pastoral need um, and to be less rigid. And so confession became more frequent and it was no longer something that was just a once in a lifetime thing, but it became a regular part of Christian life. And later the practice of spiritual counselling, of spiritual guidance in the monastic life, uh, came to influence the sacrament of confession in the parishes also. Um, and what I mean by this is that in, in the monasteries, in, in the monastic life, amongst progress in the ascetic life, in prayer and so on, was aided by the continuous guidance of the spiritual father, who was usually the abbot of the monastery. Um, and the spiritual father himself was not necessarily an ordained priest, so he could not always uh, provide sacramental absolution. He could not, strictly speaking, do the sacrament of confession as such. But he would hear the struggles, the difficulties, the sins that the person was um, dealing with, and then would advise him accordingly. 
So a person would say, you know, I can't, I can't get up to say my prayers. What should I do? Uh, should I do? You know, should I be fasting more rigorously or less rigorously? So I keep having these bad thoughts and so on. And the abbot would, to all his monks, give this sort of guidance about how to improve their spiritual life. And if the abbot was not an ordained priest, then a priest who, who was able to uh, actually do the sacrament of confession would come and, and do the prayer of absolution and so on. Um, and as a result, as confession developed, we, we've, we have this, now this double character in confession, which is not just the absolution, the, the receiving forgiveness of sins, but also spiritual guidance. Um, and so, therefore, confession should not be seen purely in terms of confessing our sins and receiving forgiveness, but also in terms of improving ourselves, improving our spiritual life. And this is important because we often find ourselves committing and confessing the same sins over and over again. And so we need help to overcome these sins and passions. And advice as well in regards to dealing with you know, a lot of spiritual and moral dilemmas um, that we face, difficult situations affected by our modern lifestyles. Um, and so it is particularly beneficial for anyone who takes spiritual life seriously to have a confessor who is also capable of acting as a spiritual father, like a mentor or guide, who will help uh, the Christian develop and progress in his spiritual life. And this is, by the way, just as important for us clergy as it is for you, laity, because we clergy often deal with many problems, not only regarding our own spiritual life, but also our ministry. And so it's important for us priests, however experienced or knowledgeable we may be, to have another priest to refer to and confess to. We priests also go to confession. Um, now, of course, the spiritual father of the clergy and of all the flock, uh, including even the monasteries under his jurisdiction, is the bishop. Uh, but it's perfectly normal for priests to act as spiritual fathers under the authority of the bishop. The priest is basically nothing more than the bishop's delegate. So even when we celebrate the liturgy, we do so in the name of the bishop. So likewise, we, we hear confessions, we act as spiritual fathers under his... Uh, with his blessing under his guidance. The ideal though is that the, the confessional spiritual father should be a priest with whom you can easily have regular contact, if not the local parish priest, at least a priest who lives in a city or town. I say this because there are so many people, uh, I remember when I was living in, in Thessaloniki in Greece, uh, uh, you know, a woman would tell me, uh, I have a spiritual father, he, he lives on, he's a monk on Mount Athos. And I said, well, what's the point of that? You're never gonna go there. Uh, and he rarely would come to visit. And there seems to be this idea, and I'll touch upon this later, that it's very strong in, in places like Greece and Russia and so on, the idea that we need to have some holy person as a spiritual father, and regardless of what our relation, whether we have regular contact, somehow having such a spiritual father is sufficient. And of course, this is a bit, some sort of pseudo-piety there, like the idea that because I have a, a spiritual father who's holy, therefore that means I'm okay. It doesn't obviously work that way. Um, there is no rule for how often or when a person should go to confession. Uh, this really depends on the conscience of the individual. But I imagine a, lo a lot of us would go to confession a lot more if we were more aware of our sins and if we felt more deeply that need uh, to be forgiven and reconciled with God. It is important to set time aside for reflection, perhaps during prayer, when we can quieten down and think about the things that we have done wrong, the things which we should be doing in our lives that we are not doing, the things which are preventing us from repentance, from getting coming closer to God. Um, so it's helpful before confession to, to have some time of reflection, to really think about, you know, am I really behaving as I should. Um, in the Orthodox Church, in, in confession, for those of you who have not, never experienced it, it's, it's done face to face, pretty much like we are now. There's no sort of confessional box, nothing dividing the priest from the, the confess, confessee. Um, and some people find this uncomfortable, but I think this more personal approach is, is more of a help than a hindrance. 
It's one thing to disclose your sins to a wall knowing someone's listening. It's another thing to look someone in the eye, even if you can't, well, even if you can't look them in the eye, but stand you know, in front of somebody and, and say, admit exactly to what you've done and, and what you are. This actually helps us to humble ourselves, to break this false image of ourselves we all entertain. A lot of people say, why do I need to go to a priest for confession? I can just you know, confess to God, I can pray in front of an icon and so on. I said, yes, but you, even when we do that, we still have this... It's not, we don't, we're not really humbling ourselves. The fact that we, are, you know, we have this icon or we have a, the God of our imagination in our heads, but we refuse to actually really, really be open about our own sins. There's a certain... Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's. It doesn't really. I don't think it's. It's helpful. Um, and I think it's this. Uh, one of the things we stand from the experience. Stand again from the experience of going to confession, is this. This humility. This humbling ourselves. Um, because humility isn't just being modest. It's. It's basically comparing yourself to God and realizing, on the one hand, how sinful you are. But on the other hand, realizing how much God loves you despite that. So it shouldn't be seen as something purely negative. A lot of people think of confession as, you know, sort of almost like you know, degrading yourself or humili humiliating yourself, having, feeling bad about yourself. But ultimately, that's, that's only the beginning. What people lose out in confession is where it leads you. There's this process of you go through that. But this is the wonderful thing, is that when you realise, when you acknowledge how bad you really are, and then you, you realise that God still loves you and forgives you, that's, it, it just makes you, fills you with love, with joy, with peace, with, with uh, gladness. Um, and that's what we go through uh, in every confession. Uh, we, we acknowledge our sin, we realise how sinful we are, and then we hear this wonderful prayer in confession, May God, who through the prophet Nathan forgave the sins of David after he confessed them, this is in the Old Testament, and who forgave Peter, bitterly weeping his denial, and the harlot, shedding tears at his feet, and the tax collector, and the prodigal, may the same God forgive you all your sins, both in this world and in the world to come, through me a sinner, and may he set you uncondemned before his fearful judgment seat, having no further care for the sins which you have confessed, to go in peace. I love that prayer because it, it directly connects the person who's in confession with these saints of, of the Bible. And it, it makes you realize that we are in that group, in that church. We, we are, you know, Peter himself was a sinner. David was a sinner. Uh, all these sinners who found salvation and, and holiness and sanctity. And we are compared with them. We are put into that category. And I think that's very uplifting. Um, Another important aspect of confession, as I said already, is, is the idea of spiritual guidance. Um, and in my experience, the greatest danger in spiritual life arises not when someone is ignorant about his faith, but when he starts to learn about it. Um, and for example, when I was, when I was uh, a student in Greece and I was doing theology there, I met a lot of Orthodox converts, uh, and they'd learned a great deal about orthodoxy through their own reading and so on. They learned a lot about canon law, the system of church government, all the rules about uh, and regulations about fasting and confession and penances and all of this stuff. And they all were very into the monastic literature, you know, the writings of the Desert Fathers and all these, these monks and so on. The problem was that they, in their enthusiasm, they devoured all of this. They had no discernment and they could not understand that not all of this applied to them. There were some writings which were written by monks for monks, telling them you should only sleep for one hour and you should pray for three hours a day and so on. And they thought, well, this is what we have to do. And <laughs> it had some very, very bad uh, uh, consequences. They either became very cold and uncompassionate. Basically, they seemed to insist that everyone must do this, and if they don't, then they're not taking their faith seriously. Or, on the other hand, they found it so difficult and oppressive, they gave up orthodoxy altogether. Um, and this is a, a very a dangerous thing. Part of the role of the spiritual father, the confessor, is being someone who would come to know the spiritual child well, uh, would be able to tell each person what he or she 
should it do and what she, he or she is capable of doing. Not just about what the Orthodox Church says and what this or that book says, but what each person can do individually according to his ability in his particular uh, situation. There's no point in asking uh, a 90 year old woman with all these health problems to fast the same way as a 20 year old man in the peak of his physical condition. There's no point in expecting uh, a single mother with five children to get to church in time as a, an 18 year old student. Um, and this is one of the, another important thing about the spiritual father. Um, because there are things which are, you know, straightforward, that we know what we have to you know, love God, love our neighbour, go to church, take communion, etc. But there are some differences and variations, how much one person can do. Someone lives far further away from the church than somebody else. Someone has uh, you know, health problems, cannot receive communion uh, without having to eat something in the morning. The spiritual father basically helps each person know what they can do. And not only... Uh, to um, to sort of encourage them to have, you know, put more effort into their life, but also to make them realise, especially when they're too enthusiastic, to realise you are you know you're pushing yourself too far and you're going to snap. And that's important that we understand this. That um, that what we said before, orthodoxy was like what we call the royal path, the middle road, and this applies also to the ascetic life. Being too strict is just as detrimental as being too lax. There's a famous story about St. Anthony, one of the, the, found, the founder of monasticism. Um, and there was a man who saw, saw his monks uh, uh, hanging around, chatting and, having, and laughing. And he was shocked. So, you know, why, what are they, you know, why are they laughing? They should be you know, praying. Should be. And St. Anthony said he was a hunter. And he had his, his bow and arrow. And he said, to do, take an arrow and, and fire it. He, did it. he said, do, uh, do it again. Did that was a third one. He said, if I keep stretching my bow, it's going to snap. He said, the people are the same. You keep stretching them, they'll break. You can't push them that far. Another wonderful example. Um, I remember reading a book called uh, Wounded by Love, the, the life and works of Elder Porphyrios. He was um, a priest of the 20th century, a very holy man. He's considered a saint. Uh, will probably soon be canonized, I imagine. And in this book, he, begin, he describes his beginnings as a priest. And he tells us that in his early days, because uh, he was regarded as a holy person, he had queues and queues of people waiting for him uh, for confession. He would be here confession, hearing confessions all day. But he was you know, very inexperienced. He didn't have discernment. And he dealt with each confession using what is called the pavilion or the rudder, which is the, the book of church canons the regulations. So, for example, someone's committed a certain sin, you're excommunicated, excommunicated for a certain number of years, or you have to fast for so many days and all, all of this stuff. You know. um, and so when someone would confess, he would look up the sin in the book and he'd apply the required, required penance. Uh, so he'd tell people you can't take communion for so long, you have to do this many you know, prostrations or pray for so long and fast for so long. There were some, some uh, abbots, for example, there was a, a former abbot of the, of the monastery in Patmos, Amphilochios, he loved trees. He was a big tree lover. And whenever um, farmers came to him uh, for confession, he'd impose as a penance to plant a tree. <laughs> sort of make that his, his way of uh, making them do their penances. Yeah. Um, but anyway, one day this young man comes to the Porphyrios and uh, Porphyrios says, you know, when's the last time you went to confession? He said, it's been a long time. And he says, why? And the man says, I lost hope. And he said, why? He said, because the last time I came to you for confession, you told me I couldn't take communion for 13 years. So I figured I'm damned anyway, so why bother? And that's when Elder Porfirios realized that you can't do things by the book. He stops doing it that way anymore. And in fact, if you keep doing things by the book, that could be detrimental to a person's salvation. So the real gift of the spiritual father is the gift of discernment, the accuracy, where the spiritual father is able to know what a person needs, what he can cope with, and advises him accordingly. So, you know, what a priest would say to one person is not the same as what he says to another person, because each person is different. Um, in Orthodox canon law, there are two terms, theological terms, which we, we refer to, which is agrivia, like the precise observance of the rules, and egonomia, dispensation, where we bend the rules, or even break the rules, or dispend with the rules altogether, to 
help a person's salvation. Discernment's the ability to know when to apply the one, when to apply the other. My old spiritual father in, in Thessaloniki, he always used to tell me rules were made to be broken. It sounds like a rebellious thing for a priest to say, but all he was really doing was reiterating what Christ said in the Gospel. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's not, spiritual life isn't about observing rules and regulations. It's, it's about healing, the healing of the human soul and coming to know God. Um, another uh, saint of the 20th century, Justin Popovich, he expressed it beautifully when he said, to preserve the holy canons, I am ready to sacrifice my life. But at the same time, to save one person, I sacrifice all the holy canons. Um, but more important than the wisdom and discernment of the spiritual father is the obedience of the spiritual child. Going back to what I said earlier about these people who have spiritual fathers on Mount Athos they never see. Obedience is one of the virtues in Orthodox spirituality, and that's because it goes hand in hand with humility. Humility is what enables us to sacrifice our own will, to admit that we do not always know best, and to hear the advice of others. Um, so it's not just about having a great spiritual father, it's about do you actually listen to anything he actually tells you? Um, and it's far better to be obedient to a, a mediocre spiritual father than to be disobedient to a brilliant one. Some could argue Judas Iscariot's spiritual father was Jesus Christ, and a fat lot of good it did him. There we are. Um, I want to go back to the idea, though, of confession as the fruit of repentance, right? Because confession isn't simply an obligation uh, by which we mechanically receive forgiveness and are made worthy to receive communion. During Lent, in particular, a lot of people approach confession in this way. They think it's Lent. I, I want to take communion at Busca, so I should go to confession. And, you know, there's, there's only real interest in sort of fulfilling one's duty or, or receiving the prayer of absolution. But this misses the point of, of confession as, a, as repentance. And it's very, this is very strong in Russian churches as well, because in, in many Russian churches still, um, they are so obsessed with the idea that you cannot receive communion without confession. Uh, during the liturgy, they have just queues of people lining up like a conveyor belt, or uh, reading prayers over them and so on. And it just becomes this sort of thing you do without any real sincere repentance. Um, some people find it helpful to, you know, prepare a list of things they've done and so on and confess them. I don't discourage that, but it should be more than this. Um, we should not think that forgetting something, for example, means that God won't forgive us and then we have to go back again. You know, it's, God hears the prayer of the heart and the condition of the heart. The sense of being in need of God's forgiveness, the desire to be better than we are, is what should lie at the heart of confession. Um, repentance is, in fact, the necessary precondition for, for confession. It's the, the natural outcome of that is confession. Um, and this goes back to what I we was saying before about what's the point of going to the priest. So I think when there is a sincere, uh, sincere repentance, it just... It's something that you feel the need to do. Um, and I've known many people uh, who have not, you know, committed serious sins, who, who just let it fester for years and years, until eventually they, they, you know, they break down. The people who come and they're just in tears because they just can't bear the guilt or the burden anymore. It doesn't matter how much you say it to God. See, God forgives us more easily than we forgive ourselves. And what a lot of the things we, we get stand to gain from confession is to learn to forgive ourselves. A lot of the time, this is something we forget, is that, yes, God forgives, but the confession isn't... God knows what you've done and knows what you're going to say before you've even gone to the confession. It's not like he needs to hear it. The problem is that we need to hear it. We need to say it. We need to, to learn to forgive ourselves. All these things are for our spiritual benefit. Um, so they shouldn't be understood in the sense of, you know, God will not forgive without the confession. But there's more to spiritual life than, than that. Um, so basically, sacramental confession is the response to sincere repentance, and it's the beginning of our spiritual healing. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, a lot of people seem to think that you know you confess something once and that's it; you can forget it. Yes, on the one hand, in the confession, the sin is forgiven, but on the other hand, it's you know 
like I said, it takes a long time sometimes for very serious sins to to come to terms with it, to forgive oneself. So it's not just something where you just turn up and then yeah, that's it, you're finished. It, it, you know, this this is very um, this doesn't this doesn't help a lot uh, uh, people very much when they approach with that uh, mentality. Um, on the other hand, there are people who seem to think confession is totally meaningless and hypocritical if you keep committing the same sins again and again. A lot of people say, you know, it's very hypocritical to come to confess when you know you're going to fall into the same sin again. <sighs> to put it mildly, that's a very cold, rational approach, I think, to confession. We would do, remember, do well to remember the words of the psalm. A sacrifice to God is a broken spirit, a broken and humbled heart God will not despise. And the parable of the tax collector. The tax collector went into the temple, beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me. And the Pharisee who went there to pray to say, thank you God for making me such a lovely person. And it was the tax collector that went home justified and forgiven. Um, now, yes, spiritual development is one of the purposes of confession, but the sincere expression of contrition for our sins is more important. I prefer someone who comes to confession repeatedly in tears to confess the same sins again and again than people who come just you know, sort of satisfied with themselves because they only have little things to confess. It's, it's not about, um, well for me it's not simply about, you know, are you going to you know, stop doing this? It, it's about that genuine sense of, I need God's help, I'm not, I'm far from being what I need to be. And, you know, however many times we come back, if that sense of humility and repentance is sincere, God, I believe God forgives us. Uh, and we should not be discouraged from, from doing that. And a lot of people shouldn't feel like they're wasting the priest's time or boring the priest with repeating these things again and again. We need this. This is, this is the Christian life. It's not, repentance isn't a one-in-a-lifetime event that you, you just, you know, you repent and that's it, you stopped. It's continuous. It's constantly falling and getting up, falling and getting up. Um, Sometimes a lot of people use confession simply as a sort of an excuse to have a chat with a priest or to discuss their spiritual life and so on. Um, that's obviously that's part of confession, but unless there is actually something to confess, it's better to set time aside uh, to talk to the priest about these these things. Um, people shouldn't feel that when you have a spiritual father that it's only about confession time. There's he's called a father. So there is that personal relationship uh, where it's not just about arranging an appointment for confession, but where you actually have a relationship where you can uh, be more open in general about these things. I'm going to wrap up now because we're running out of time. Basically what we need is a real rediscovery of the spiritual character and content of church life a deep understanding in heart and soul and mind of our calling to come into union with God. Like the prodigal son, we need to recognize our alienation from God, our sinfulness, our distance from our true home and calling. And we need to understand that this home is the church and we always need to come home. We always need to be reconciled with God and with the body of believers that is the church and our fellow Christians. So basically, confession is really necessary for us to continuously rediscover our identity as Orthodox Christians. I'll leave it there. I should be able to answer at least a couple of questions briefly if you have any. <laughs> so that's very, you know, okay. self-explanatory. I didn't realize it was so uh, comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs>